We are tired. All right, it's time for our meeting to convene. We have a quorum here, so we call the Regulated Industries Committee to order. We've got two bills on our agenda today. They're both going to be hearing only. Senate Bill 146, Senator Gooch is going to present to us, and Senate Bill 149, Senator Albers will present in that order. We have sign-up sheets. If anybody missed, we'll... Uh, We'll leave out the one for Senate Bill 149. If you want to be on 146, you didn't sign up, jump up real quick now and raise your hand and wave it, and we'll put you on there. Will you shoot that around, Alex? Let them keep signing up. Two bills. All right, Senator Gooch, do you want to present from your chair? That's fine with me if you want to. Whatever, whatever makes you the happiest uh, somebody was calling you senator ego last time and I was, if you want to be on tv better you can get up there if you'd like to i know that's not true of course but uh someone yeah disparage us like that would not all right senate bill 146 if it pays the same i'll just sit here that'd be fine all right thank you chairman and committee members um senate bill 146 is a is the first of what I think will become many bills moving forward in the future. It culminates from the work that was done last year by the study committee, the joint study committee between the House and the Senate. We went over that that big report. Was it last week or two weeks ago? So I'm not going to go back through all of that. But we had members from the Senate and the House working on that, along with some private sector and public sector people. A lot of input from multiple um, industries car dealers, the utility companies, uh, the convenience store operators. Uh, there, there's a, the room's full of them. I think you'll, you know who they are, but I want to thank Senators Lucas, Senator Ginn, Senators Cowsert and Walker, Senator Robertson, and of course the House members that my co-chairman was uh, Rick Jaspers over there, but we also had the DOT Commissioner Russell McMurray, the Department of uh, Economic Development Commissioner Pat Wilson and the chair of the Public Service Commission, Tricia Pridemore, who worked throughout the summer and fall. Getting us to where we are, um, a lot of input from the organizations were valuable in our testimony. Uh, there's no doubt that the uh, the growth of the electric vehicle industry is is going to continue to grow over the next several years. Uh, throughout the study committee process, we heard from several speakers expressing their uh, projections that about 30% of consumers are already considering purchasing an EV for their next vehicle. In fact, we had testimony from General Motors who stated that by the year 2035, they will no longer produce an automobile with a combustible engine. So that's not far off. That's 12 years away. So we think that we need to start now to prepare for that. And so this bill, if you look at uh, SB 146, LC number 393720, is basically a basic framework to get us started moving in that direction. I think Georgia is one of the leading states in the country to begin this process. Other states have similar um, efforts underway. Some have pilot projects. We hope to be part of a pilot project as well. But before I start explaining the bill, let me just say that I appreciate this being a hearing only. We want input. We've already gotten some input from the different people in the room. And so I think it'll make a better bill if we can work through this over the next couple of weeks before crossover. If you look at Section 1, Section 1 deals with the Georgia Territorial Act, uh, which you're all familiar with, is which is the main reason I wanted this bill to come through your committee, Chairman Kowser. It provides that the sale of electricity provided by an electric vehicle charger for the purposes of the charging an electric vehicle is not subject under the Georgia Territorial Service Act. Uh, Section 2 deals with the regulatory measures and trade practices necessary for the sale of electricity. Uh, to charge electric vehicles. It puts regulatory authority in the Office of the Commissioner of Agriculture for the administration and the inspection of charging stations similar to fuel pumps today. If you pull up to a gas station today, you'll see uh, a sticker on each gas pump where it's been inspected by the Department of Agriculture. The commissioner's name will be on that, which means that they have tested that equipment to verify that that pump is actually 
properly pump and fuel, and a gallon is a gallon. And so we think we're going to need to have the same measures and the same accountability in charging stations to, if you're paying for electricity by the kilowatt, then when you pay for 10 kilowatts, you ought to receive 10 kilowatts. And the only way to do that is if a government agency certifies and, and holds those stores and those public charging stations accountable. Uh, there will be penalties uh, outlined in, in the, uh, the bill as well. Section 2-1 is related to the code section regarding signage for motor fuel sales. This just clarifies that the code section should just relate to motor fuel and not electricity sales from electric vehicle charging stations. So you see the at every gas station, you see the, the display lit up out front on how much the price of gasoline is. This law, this bill does not require that signage for the electric vehicles at this time. That's a discussion we can have in the future as to whether that should be required or not. It also ensures that electric charging stations will charge by the kilowatt hour to provide a standard measurement across all charging stations. And so currently most charging stations allow you to charge a car and you pay a fee based on time. Uh, I think that may be different with Tesla. I'm not sure if they even charge a fee or not. I think they have some kind of a subscription service we can hear from them later today. But the typical part, public charger will charge based on time. So this would change that to allow for charging by kilowatt. Section three of the bill deals with how the sale of electric power for charging electric vehicles would be taxed similar to how we tax motor fuel tax today, setting a gallon equivalent of no less than 33.7 kilowatts. So in other words, the energy that an electric car would, would use would be 33.7 kilowatts to the what would be the same energy used with a gallon of gasoline. And so that's the conversion. And that number may be subject to uh, change as well. We've had some feedback recently as to whether that number is exact or not. We'll work on that in the coming days to make sure that's accurate. However, this bill does not immediately levy a tax on the electric sales of, for electric vehicle charging. Nowhere in this bill does, is there a, a fee or a tax to levy on that, that charging station. That's got to be determined and that'll have to be brought forward again in the future. Um, I've already received feed feedback from a lot of groups, as I said earlier, and we look forward to making proper changes in, uh, after we hear from those today and in the coming days. So I want to reiterate the importance of this legislation as Georgia welcomes the growth of the electric vehicles. Governor Kemp has made it clear that he hopes that Georgia will become the electric mobility capital of America, and the creation of this framework is a great step forward in that direction. And uh, at this time, I'll stop and we'll take questions at your discretion. Any committee members have questions for the majority leader? Senator Ginn. And I have a little bit of, I'm in number three. A, uh, one of the things that, that for me, and I want everybody to be familiar with the definition when you define an electric vehicle, the, uh, on line 60, electric vehicle means a vehicle that is propelled by one or more electric motors fueled by energy stored in the form of a rechargeable battery. Your typical plug-in electric vehicle, your Teslas and all those things, you know, they're plugging into a, an outlet. They're charging those batteries. This would also include a, a hybrid vehicle, a Prius or something like that, because they have electric motors that, that are have batteries on, on a vehicle like that. And so uh, in that definition, we're including not only plug-in electric vehicles, but any type of plug-in hybrid, as well as a full hybrid the, uh, in the, the situation. And I don't know what the long-term effect would, of that would be if we get around to talking about the energy usage and you know some way that we're gonna tax it. And that's one of the things I'd like for you to help address if you would for our committee. <clears throat> Okay, I'll just answer. respond. To, <clears throat> I think the intent is to make sure we have parity for everyone that uses the public roads. We worked hard back in 2015 when we passed House Bill 170. There were a lot of exemptions to motor fuel tax. We had buses that were exempt. We had local government vehicles that were exempt. And 
people were driving on the roadways in the state and we eliminated all the exemptions. I believe this should be applied to regardless of the fuel source of a car or a truck on the road. I think everyone should pay of their fair share. And so if we're going to use electricity to offset the cost of gasoline or some other type fuel, then that should be taxed accordingly as well. So we can work on the language if you'd like. I don't know where, but you're not, as long as you're not trying to exempt hybrids from being classified as an electric car, I think we're fine. But if you're trying to use this for some kind of an exemption, I think we're going down a slippery slope. I don't have a, a pathway one way or the other, but I do think it's important that we, we recognize when you give a definition for a vehicle, what all that could encompass. One of the things that uh, we always want to encourage people to drive more fuel efficient vehicles. And whether that be, uh, they, they've, you're buying a, you know, new, new pickup truck that gets 15 or 20 miles a gallon versus, you know, you, you've gone out and you bought a uh, much more fuel efficient vehicle. Yeah. We want to encourage that as much as we can. And I, I don't want to discourage somebody that if they decide, Hey, I want to make the capital investment to buy a hybrid vehicle because I'm going to get better mm -hmm. fuel mi mileage, but we do want them to pay their fair share. Usually the heavier vehicles, the pickup trucks and things like that, more wear and tear. Sure. You know, these these fully electric vehicles are going to be way more than than other vehicles. That And so we've got to balance all that. And that's where, for me, I just want to make sure the committee members are aware of, you know, how do we interpret that definition? I think it's if it's if it's a plug in vehicle, you're charging it from a cord or a outside exterior. Uh, power source, then it should be classified as an electric vehicle. If it's a full hybrid, do we do we want to incorporate those? That's the question. Is is if a vehicle only you're only putting gasoline into it, it's not have doesn't never get plugged into an outlet. If it never gets charged from an outside power source, then maybe not. And and that's where for me right now the definition that you have here would include. And, and I'm not that familiar. I don't own a Prius. Don't know what you know. But I I don't think. Oh, there's a lot of hybrids that don't have a plug. They're not plug-in mm -hmm. hybrids. And so for me, the way this is, is done, those hybrids do have an electric motor on them and they do use electricity and they do carry batteries. And so for me, that's where in that scope, we need to make sure that we're addressing how you want to do it. Because I, I, you know, I'm not familiar with, with the bill as much as you are and just want to make sure that's sure. brought to the committee members. If you have a suggestion as how to clarify that language, I think the author has made his intent clear. It's vehicles that have to receive power from an external source, basically. Uh, and, and give us any language because we're uh, certainly willing to do a little committee sub or a, a amendment to get this right. We're trying to get the framework right. You bring up a very good point. Since today is just a hearing, I just wanted to bring that to the Appreciate committee members and you know, I think that what he's actually shooting for is a plug-in hybrid or a, a plug-in electric vehicle, not something that's a full-blown hybrid. Feel a full-blown hybrid just uses gasoline to generate electricity. Feel free to bring any proposed language you can think of that captures what your meaning is. Uh, Senator Albers, you're recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Leader Gooch, great work on you and the committee in doing this. I do have one question. I like the idea of charging by the kilowatt. Uh, I think you got 33.7. Today, we obviously have the the annual fee they're paying. I think it's $200, um, which is to offset what they would normally pay in gas tax for the wear and tear on the roads. Mm -hmm. If they were going to then also be um, taxed in this manner for their offset for road usage, are you foreseeing that we're somehow going to adjust that in the future so they're not double dinged? Sure. Yeah, the idea is to eliminate the $200 fee, if at, at some point in the future, we'll address this, uh, whether you use a road usage charge, BMT, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the annual fee was established back in 2015 uh, based on an average number of miles driven based on, I think it was 24 miles to the gallon. So we only had a small number of electric cars on the road, Tesla, Nissan, Leafs, there were, you know, half dozen Today, there's many more options and more are coming. We heard from Kia recently. They're developing an electric fleet. They're, they're going to be pushing it out soon. 
so the idea is to figure out what's fair. $200 per year may sound high to some people that may only drive to and from work or to the grocery store and back or, you know, make short trips around town. On the other hand, you may have service delivery trucks like Amazon or FedEx or whomever that could drive 40, 50,000 miles per year. $200 doesn't come close to covering what they would be paying in motor fuel tax if they were being driven by gasoline or diesel powered trucks. So thank you. Yep. Other questions from committee members? All right, we have quite a few people signed up to speak on the bill today. Let me get my list and we'll start okay. being heard. Let's get started. Right. Was that it? Sorry. Stephanie Gossman, Georgia Power. If you would take the uh, podium up there with the, I always want to call it a witness stand. I know the legal stuff comes back out at me some days. Welcome here. If you'll please identify yourself and who you're with and give us your thoughts on this bill. Absolutely. Well, good afternoon. And, and first, I want to say thank you to this committee for your leadership to establish the Joint Study Committee for the Electrification of Transportation last year. I also appreciate the opportunity to speak um, in support of Senate Bill 146 today. My name is Stephanie Gossman. I'm the Electric Transportation Manager for Georgia Power Company. And in this role, I lead the department that's responsible for the development implementation and administration of the electric transportation offerings for our customers. The goal for my team each day is to partner with customers to reduce barriers as they integrate electric transportation technologies into their lives. And one such barrier that exists for our customers, both EV charging service providers as well as EV drivers, is the desire to sell and purchase EV charging services by the kilowatt hour instead of per unit of time throughout Georgia. Although nothing in the Territorial Act prohibits EV charging companies for billing by the kilowatt hour for charging services, we recognize through collaboration with multiple stakeholders the past two years that this area needs additional clarity, and that's why it's critical to pass this legislation to make it clear that charging companies can bill by the kilowatt hour without violating the law. Billing for EV charging services by the kilowatt hour is important to the growing number of EV drivers in Georgia because it makes more sense to pay for the energy consumed instead of the amount of time someone is plugged into the charger. EV batteries are measured by kilowatt hour, similar to how a gas tank is measured in gallons, and paying for the energy consumed in kilowatt hours is analogous to paying for the gas that you pump at this station instead of the time you spend at the pump. Georgia Power serves as an EV charging service provider of last resort with less than 3% of the public charging market in Georgia. All of Georgia Power's chargers are capable of complying with the proposed legislation, and we look forward to working with Leader Gooch, Chairman Kowser, and the members of this committee as the bill moves through the legislative process. Given Georgia's leadership among the nation with our growing EV ecosystem, it's imperative that we set the right foundation on behalf of all Georgians. Thank you for your time and attention to this matter. I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions from committee members? Senator again, you're yeah. recognized. Thank you for your testimony. One of the things that I'm kind of curious, and I know when we start looking at motor fuel tax equivalents, what do we do? How would you all recommend that you'd like to see us deal with uh, somebody that's home charging, somebody that, that you know, what are the, what, what's the right answer for George Power on that? Well, I think we've mentioned the the DOT pilot in particular. I'm interested to see how that goes because I think there's a variety of solutions. However, each one has some pros and cons, right? There, there's gaps depending on how you look at it. And this pilot, I think, is a really good start. And I don't know if you could answer this question, but one of the things that to me, you know, I could see you have a meter the uh, that's in the manufacturing process of an electric vehicle, that keeps up with how many total kilowatt hours are going into a vehicle, records that, or you, you have a separate meter the uh, there at somebody's residence or business that, that's keeping up with the kilowatt hours sold in that way. What kind of cost would be involved if if you said, hey, we're going to have a separate electric meter the uh, for a residential customer? You know, that, that, I think it would be pretty expensive, but I'd, I'd love for you to weigh in on that. Yeah, I, I don't have a number. 
but there are certainly many challenges, cost being one of them in terms of putting meters in people's homes to specifically monitor the EV charging at their homes, because right now that's not separately metered. Thank you. All right. Other committee members have questions? All right. Thank you for being with us today. We appreciate you. your testimony. Jason Bragg. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, Jason Bragg, Vice President of Government Relations with Georgia EMC, representing our state's 41 electric membership cooperatives. Um, I'll be very brief. Our comments are going to largely reflect Georgia powers, but I want to thank uh, Leader Gooch, Chairman Calzert, and the rest of everybody uh, in the Senate and in the House that, and all the other members that participate in the study committee as well. Um, my comments are going to focus largely on part one, section one one of the bill that has to deal with deals with uh, the sales by the kilowatt hour issue. Like like Stephanie said, we agree this is a needed change in law. The language that Senator that Leader Gooch has included in his bill um, includes a carefully crafted crafted compromise between electric utilities, both the EMCs, Georgia Power, Muni's, also convenience stores and others that we feel um, allows retailers the uh, ability to do this like they would like to do and sell by the kilowatt hour EV charging services, but also protects the integrity of our state's territorial act. So with that, um, just want to thank the committee for their work and I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions? Senator Gann, quite active today. Well, I, you know, us. you're paying attention. You must've read this bill in advance. The, uh, I got to cliff notes. The, uh, Go back to that fuel equivalent. And I don't want to put you on the spot. So if you want to defer, you'll be glad to yes, let's do that. But I'm looking at line 304 in the bill. And when we're talking about a gasoline equivalent, this says electricity shall not be less than 33.7 kilowatts. Well, kilowatts is amount of power at, at, at any point in time. That's a that's a it's not a not a quantity of power, it's just a rate of power. And so for me, was that supposed to be kilowatt hours? Would you what would you think that would be? The uh because I'm I'm trying to put that into when we think about gasoline, you know, you can use gallons per hour, gallons per minute, gallons per second as a rate of okay, here's how much you're burning. But what you really look at is the total amount of energy that you burn in gallons, and that's why we pay the the rate that we do for taxes on uh, gasoline. On electricity, KW is how much you're using at any point in time, the uh, not a quantity of electricity. So not put you on the spot, but I, um, I don't know whether that question should go to you or to the bill author or how we deal with that. I'll, I will defer that. I, I can, I'll, I don't know if I know the answer to your question right now. I'll try to get it, but I think I may defer to the author on that as well and kind of why that uh, legislative council drafted that the way they did. Thank you. Yes, sir. Senator Gooch, do you have an answer now or do you want to? You know, I think, think Senator again wakes up in the middle of the night trying to think of a trick question. You know he's an engineer. That's the way they think. Oh, I know. We should we should put him on on a uh, consulting contract at GDOT. But um, so the idea of line 30 or 304 is to give a conversion of what a the energy amount is from a gallon of gasoline. So it equates to 33.7 kilowatts of electricity. Now, if that's kilowatt hours, I don't know. We'll ask the, the engineers in the room at some point. But if that needs to be clarified, we we put an H beside kilowatts and you're happy. But, that's a quantity of power, right. kilowatt so hours. So the idea is to find the conversion of the energy of what is a gasoline-powered engine burn in a gallon of gas. How much energy is that compared to electricity? And the answer is 33.7 kilowatts. Could be hours. I right. think I think somebody's gonna have to give me an answer on that. All right. Other questions for Mr. Bright? Uh, I got just a sort of a general question. Sure. You you have made it clear that you support this portion of the bill that uh, maintains the Territorial Service Act boundaries. Why does that make sense with mobile? devices like cars that 
that aren't a resident or a business located within a geographic territory, but they're moving all across the state. So I think what what I what I meant there, and I'm sorry if I didn't clarify that correctly, is the the provision of the EV charging services by the retailer, since you're essentially reselling power. Um, what I mean there is it doesn't get into any other aspect of selling power. So basically all they're doing is providing EV charging services to the user that comes up and hooks them to the to the car. Um, I don't I don't think that there's anything about a mobile aspect to it. I don't think it has anything to do with territorial boundaries. It just has to do with this provision of these services does not violate and does not tr trigger a mechanism that could have the retailer be considered an electric utility. Okay. So if is it your position that if a charging station is located within the territorial boundaries of one of your 41 EMCs, that only that MC, EMC can sell power to them for the ultimate resale? If it's if it's if it's within with if it's within the existing boundaries of the territory, yes, I think so. Yeah. Why wouldn't your people want to be able to sell power statewide? It's a little different than a you know, somebody being a, a resident or a business located in your place. I think for the purposes of EV charging, I mean, if there's a, if it's large enough to be a customer choice load, which I think there may be a few banks of, you know, maybe some of the larger Tesla banks could be, you know, I think there's opportunities for our folks to serve those as an existing customer, as a, as a new customer choice load under the, under the existing territorial act. Um, in terms of us expanding outside of our boundaries, I, you know, I don't. You wouldn't have to run wires. You could just sell outside. It might be to a benefit if you're able to sell cheaper. You know, you're saying as a as a as an EV charging retailer, almost. Right. Um, you know, I don't think we have any inter any interest in our industry right now to do that. Um, that may change in the future, but I don't I don't see any. We don't have members talking about that right now at all. Okay. Thank you for being with us today. We appreciate. Yes, you. sir. Appreciate. I'm Ms. Angela Holland. Well, thank you, Chairman and members of the committee, and uh, thank you uh, for for bringing forth the bill. I'm Angela Holland. I serve as the president of the Georgia Association of Convenience Stores, and we represent about a third of the stores in the state. Um, there's a, a whole lot in this bill that we certainly appreciate. It was nice to go through it and be able to compare it to um, a lot of what was in Title 10 and to be able to say, oop, that matches 10-1, 149. Um, all the way through about 164, so or 165. So uh, we really appreciate the way it's been set up. We do have um, some questions and just, you know, questions in general with it we'd like to to go over with the author offline, but we really appreciate the way that it's been drafted. You good to go with the selling by the kilowatt hour? Yes. It's really kind of hard to do it any other way, isn't it? it when that comes along we believe so and I, yeah. I do feel like the language in here says that it 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 that, that is the only way it can be sold yeah the i feel like it was uh, covered george power and emc seem very comfortable that that's the sensible way to do it just like you would be selling to a, another customer since you guys are probably going to be the ones doing most of the reselling i just want to make sure you're you're good with that we are all right other committee members have questions for miss holland Oh, Senator Ginn's gone. You're off the hook. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Let's go quick before Thanks. it gets back. All right. Uh, ben Kessler, charge point. Good afternoon, committee members. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, happy Valentine's Day. Um, I'm probably going to echo what a lot of the other commenters have made, but um, certainly thank you to Governor Kemp for creating this joint study committee that has gotten us to this point. And thank you, uh, Senator Gooch, for your leadership on this and, and uh, yeah. Representative Jasper, as well as the other members who, who got us to this point where we are today. Um, so certainly, uh, you know, SB 146, uh, we do support this. Uh, the charging for charging language for kilowatt hour is something that uh, we as ourselves and our customers certainly support as a way to increase investments in the state of Georgia. So we certainly like that language. Uh, we do have concerns with the inspection and verification language in some of these bills. One of one of the points is that um, I know the the commissioner of agriculture will be directed to create a, a set of standards for tolerances for verifying these stations. 
uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies already has a standard out there, and we certainly would like to see the state of Georgia align with with what the national standard is for for these tolerances. Um, the other issue that comes with this for the inspectors um, is currently at this point in time is the field testing equipment for these high powered charging stations is not readily available. Um, and the ones that are readily available cost a lot of money, um, well into uh, the five to six figures mark. So um, just some things um, out there that certainly we would like to have a discussion about. Certainly look forward to working with the committee and certainly look forward um, working with Senator Gooch on this language. Um, but thank you very much for, for promoting this to address some issues in Georgia. Do you have the some written uh, standard that you can share with us, the national standards you reference. We can. Um, and if you just Google National Institute of Standards and Technology Handbook 44, um, that is where the code for electric vehicle charging stations lays. And I'm happy to follow up with the committee and provide that language as well. I would recommend you do that um, and do it fast because we're running out of committee days before crossover day, and we'll be taking action on this bill probably next week. Understood. Thank uh, you. It may be sooner than that. Uh, right. Any other questions, committee members? All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mr. Massey, I'm going to call you. You had a couple other people, and you may have somebody um, by WebEx or Zoom, whatever. Technology. Thank you, Chairman Cowser and members of the committee. My name is Lewis Massey, and our firm represents Tesla here, and um, their footprint is growing rapidly in Georgia. There are over 32,000 Teslas now uh, that are being driven by Georgia citizens. Uh, they have almost 200 charging locations now all over the state, metro and non-metro, and up to about 900 total uh, EV chargers, individual chargers. Today I have uh, on Zoom Bill Ehrlich and Francesca Wall, who are senior executives at Tesla in the charging policy arena. And uh, they both have brief comments for you. And uh, Bill, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Lewis. And thank you, Chairman Kauser and members of the committee. And thank you to Leader Gooch for putting this bill forward to allow for EV charging to be billed on a dollar per kilowatt hour basis. There are four recommendations we'd like to offer regarding the EV charging sections of the bill. The first is related to the display of information, um, basically the rationale uh, as written currently would require the charging station to display some information. Tesla has almost 900 chargers in the state and we display the information mentioned in the bill on our app or on the screen in the vehicle. Um, the charging stations themselves do not display the information, nor do they have screens. So our, our recommendation would be to allow for a digital pathway with some sort of uh, definition around digital network, meaning an online enabled application, website, or system offered or used by an electric vehicle charging provider that allows a user to initiate a commercial transaction to dispense electrical energy from electric vehicle supply equipment to an electric vehicle. Uh, in, in combination with that definition of a digital network, allowing therefore all electric vehicle charging stations shall be capable of accurately measuring the amount of electricity delivered to each electric vehicle on a per kilowatt hour basis. This information shall be displayed on the electric vehicle supply equipment or on the electric vehicle supply providers digital network. This is an extremely um, important point for us as well as other uh, existing providers in the state. The second piece that we'd uh, like to provide recommendation on is that multifamily units uh, be treated the same as single family homes since residents are also charging at their homes. Um, the idea here would be to add language on the definition of residence uh, on my version it's line 69 and the language would be, or a multifamily building in which the charging equipment is installed in or adjacent to a private residence for non-commercial use or provided for the exclusive use of an individual or a group of individuals, including employees, tenants, visitors, or residents of a multi-unit housing. We feel it's important that uh, people just living in multi-unit dwellings are treated similarly as those living in single family homes. I'd like to add, hand it off to my colleague, Francesca Wall, 
uh, to speak about uh, some elements related to NIST and the, the measurement standards. And then I have one, one last point. All right, we'll save questions till you come back for your last point then. Ms. Wall? Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to provide brief comment. Um, it was mentioned by the previous speaker that there is already a standard in place for electric vehicle charging systems um, by the National Institute of Standards in Handbook 44 that deals with um, commercial transactions and the measurement of those. And so similarly, um, providing alignment with what's in that code is important. One important distinction though to note is that code exempts DC fast charging um, from certain components of it until January 1st, 2028. So we want to make sure there is some protection in the legislation that looks at legacy equipment that is in the ground today and also aligns around the 2028 date for any requirements on the fast charging infrastructure side. Um, and we're happy to provide more detailed comments on that. Um, but again, it's driving alignment with what's an existing um, national guidance. And I will hand it back to Mr. Ehrlich. Thanks, Francesca. And thank you again, committee members, for the opportunity to provide these um, important points uh, on the bill. The, the fourth thing I'd like to um, highlight is related to the uh, proposed motor fuel <clears throat> tax equivalent on dollar per kilowatt hour charging. We understand the, um, the need uh, and the intention of, of what's being proposed. And there's a couple of things as a charging service provider that we're seeing on our electricity bills, as well as how we'll be treated by the Department of Revenue when we are able to charge on a dollar per kilowatt hour basis that I'd like to talk through quickly which are, uh, I believe, relevant, and, and this is the right forum to, to bring them up. Right now, as it stands today, we pay sales tax on our electricity bills to uh, Georgia Power and the other utility companies that we are a customer of across the state. So that sales tax is being paid as electric sales tax on all of our electricity bills. When we sell charging service to the end-use EV driver, since it is billed on a time basis today, that is being considered a service and sales tax is not being collected at that end use transaction as it stands right now. Once we are able to bill on a dollar per kilowatt hour basis at the end use transaction to EV drivers, we will become subject to uh, general sales and use tax uh, on those transactions. Um, the, that 4% state sales tax is expected to, uh, you know, all transactions are expected to be subject to that once that change takes place. We are very much so supportive of the ability to charge on a dollar per kilowatt hour basis. However, although maybe unintentionally, it would subject us to this tax. And we would like to see, uh, rather than having three taxes on these kilowatt hours being on the electric bill that we pay to the utility provider. Then when we sell the kilowatt hour again to the end use EV driver, and then third, the motor fuel tax equivalent being proposed, ideally we would see a single tax on a percentage basis collected at the end use transaction between EV charging provider and EV driver. And having that uh, collected on a percentage basis is much easier from an implementation standpoint, and we fully support that money being allocated to roads and, and road usage um, in that, that way. So your company operates nationwide. Are other states taxing by the kilowatt hour by percentage of the end usage that you're referencing there? Great question. Right now, it is it is state by state. I would say more often, more often than not, we are collecting sales tax at that end use transaction um, with the EV driver, and it is usually a state sales tax. And we believe that that state sales tax being charged should be allocated to roads and, and road usage, and and that's 
why we're so happy this opportunity, you know, is here with this bill. That's effectively what we're doing with motor fuel taxes because it's dedicated. And I think that's why leader Gooch is trying to at least set the framework to tax that, that way. We're not setting a tax rate in this bill, but do you know what the rate would be in other States? Are they charging by kilowatt hours or, I mean, or taxing by how much usage? So typically the there are not many um kilowatt hour taxes across the country right now normally when we are collecting sales tax at that end use transaction it is at the the standard state sales tax rate um but that money is going just to the general fund it is it is typically not being allocated towards roads and we think that is something uh that should be looked at. All right, well, that's the way we do it here in Georgia. And so you're gonna like our bill. Uh, hey. All right, other questions? Thank you guys. I think whoop, we got a question from the author of the bill. I didn't catch his name. Um, you said that, Eric. is it Bill? Yes. You made a comment that some of your, I guess you said all of your Tesla chargers, you're paying a sales tax or you're not paying a sales tax because it's a service you're selling the power based on time. Is that what you said? Yes. And, and, and part of my interpretation is leaning on a Georgia letter ruling from, uh, I believe the DOR in 2019, which I'd be happy to share uh, with the committee. So my question is if you're, if your Tesla charger is, is wired into a commercial property, let's say it's in front of a restaurant or a hotel or, even at a home and it's run through a master meter of that business, there's mm -hmm. a sales tax charge on that electricity for that entire business. How do you separate those? Oh, I, for the, I, my question? I think I understand your question. Separate so most TV of them, right. From the residential uses or, or other the commercial uses. Well, so a, right, is there always a separate meter on a Tesla charger? For us, uh, as Tesla, most of our installations are on a separate meter, so so we don't run into that situation. But I understand what you're highlighting here, which would be, um, yeah, a situation where it would be, you know, under a master meter and could be difficult to apportion that out. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for being with us. That's going to conclude our public testimony on this bill thank for you. today. Uh, everybody, we appreciate you having spent the time with us to tell us your viewpoints. Uh, it seems to me there's pretty broad consensus that uh, we should very specifically allow the resale of electricity to help us charge up these electric vehicles. Probably the best way to do that is by the kilowatt hour or some a gallonage equivalent we're trying to come up with. I haven't heard anybody really uh, have any problem with continuing to utilize uh, our Territorial Service Act to define who sells electricity to which recharging stations anyway. And I uh, hadn't heard anything back from the Department of Agriculture. We have their representatives here today. If they are willing and able to assume the uh, sort of administrative roles, regulatory roles that are set forth here. Do you wish to be heard at all? Yes, come on up. <clears throat> and then we'll, we don't have but one speaker on your bill, Senator Albers. We'll have time to knock that out real quickly. In the Department of Agriculture. Um, thank you guys for having, hearing um, a couple of comments that we have. So I've asked our team to go ahead and start getting some preliminary ideas of what it would actually look like to facilitate this process. And um, as Mr. Kessler mentioned earlier, the machines that we're looking at are, they're a little costly. They run about $50,000 a piece. Um, some of the logistics that I think we probably haven't thought all the way through, um, after you hook up the machine, the power has to go somewhere. So we're probably going to have to have electric vehicles that we drive around. Um, whether or not the battery is full when we start to charge 
or how much we use that battery to charge it all the way up and then to drain it all the way out. Um, we're not quite sure how that may affect um, the <laughs> how long we can use the car and then if it may affect the metering system itself. Um, there was some mention about the NIST standards, which we've started to kind of look into already. Um, there is a company that we've looked at called Vesco that we're interested in learning more from. They can, um, they kind of have a uniform application and they can also test Tesla chargers, which we thought was advantageous because we were concerned about having to buy multiple machines to test for different, um, different power service providers. Um, We've, we've got some numbers we're trying to put together. Um, there's not really a great model out there so far. Um, so we're kind of trying to, to put it, figure it out. Another challenge that we would like to address is, um, you know, we currently test gasoline. We pull the gas out and then we just walk over and we're able to put it back in the tank. Um, but we can't do that. Um, in this circumstance. So the, the state is is essentially getting this electricity, which is a fuel source, and we haven't quite figured out, and we would like some guidance from you guys, and how we make sure that this isn't um, the state essentially taking a fuel source without compensating for that. So there are kind of a couple of hurdles there that we're going to going to have to look through. And then, um, you know, we are, we are excited and happy to be part of this emerging market but we will need funding. It's not gonna be a small endeavor. Um, so I would be happy to talk to you guys and answer questions offline if needed. Um, and then maybe also consider a tiered effective date. Um, we think that it might be a good idea for us to start based on when we can actually begin to do the project. Um, and then I think that you could probably move forward with some of the other sections that don't require us being present. Can you think of any other agency that would be better suited to do the regulatory functions in this market? Well, that that's a loaded question. We're not trying Chairman. to stick it on part of agriculture. <laughs> if y'all don't have any interest in doing it, DOT might be able to do that. You know, I I think that's a possibility. I don't. I would hate to speak for them. Um, this is my first time testifying, so I'm that's trying correct. real hard not to step it's in it. It's good to have our old friend back. To okay. <laughs> yeah. um, well, uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, and I, I know you weren't prepared to give any detailed things. If you would, please uh, have your boss, who's a good friend of all of ours, take a look at this. And if you have any suggested changes, get them to us this week because okay. we need to uh, move this bill quickly. We will. We've, we started working on it, anticipating that you would have questions. Uh, uh, Senator Lucas has a question for you. If I can get his I, mic on you, I'm going to put you. My concern is, it seems so everybody wants to call us. If you charging, if you are getting paid for folks using the charge, if we set the price at whatever it is, like it's it, it's in this bill, then you know how much you're gonna have to pay. You ought you ought to have a record, so it it's gonna be you're gonna pay taxes on the gross. So if you're charging folks for the for the kilowatt, and I, however many kilowatts they they use, they're being charged a fee. You ought to know what the fee is and the money's coming in. So the only thing we want is the taxes. Do off the total, off the gross. We we're not talking about that. You 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 pay one over here, and you don't charge for service charge over here. That that's what this whole thing is about. Well, you are now replacing motor fuel tax, and trying to come up with a way how to basically look at electric vehicles getting on the roads and using the roads and paying for the use of the roads. And so, to me, if you got charging stations. You charging a fee to charge. You know what the fee is that you're getting. So it ought to come off the gross that you're taking, you're bringing in, whatever your bill is. All right. You got that, uh, Mr. Leader? Take that into account as you look through it. All right. Thank you, <laughs> Senator Lucas. Appreciate it. All right. Can I make a comment about yes. previous testimony from Catherine? I think. Senator again would probably be more able to explain it, but you can get load centers and you can test this equipment without having to bring an electric car 
to that site. So let's talk about that offline, but we don't need to go buy a bunch of Teslas for Tyler Harper to drive around Georgia. <laughs> uh, he, in he would fit in a Tesla really nicely though. But yeah. we'll, Small we'll talk about that later. Right. Also, um, I just want to make one point before we leave here. You know, this whole industry that's, that's evolving, there's a perception out there that you're going to be able to drive for free if you have an electric car. That is obviously not true. Um, if a gallon of gas is the equivalent of 33 kilowatts, what's the average price of a kilowatt in Georgia, Mr. Gim? 10 cents? 10, 12. 40, so what's 10 cents times 33 kilowatts? That's $3.33 a gallon equivalent. So we're going to be paying almost the same for electric cars as we are for gasoline. So it just needs to be remembered that we're not riding for free, nor is your electric car going to be getting you to and from work for free either. Somebody has to pay for the electricity that, that propels these vehicles. So. All right. Thank you very much. Senator Albers, you are recognized now to present Senate Bill 149. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senate Bill 149 is the Georgia Door-to-Door -door Sales Act. This is modeled closely after the FTC's National Door-to-Door -door Cooling Off Rule, which gives consumers the opportunity to have a three-day cooling off period uh, of a sale without a penalty. This has been in effect for over 51 years, uh, since 1972. Uh, however, the purchases for this were, were smaller uh, in nature. And what we're doing in Senate Bill 149 uh, is to simplify that Georgia consumers could have a 30-day cooling off period for products or services that meet two of three specific elements. One is $10,000 or more in cost. Number two is leasing or financing in excess of 120 months or 10 years or more. And the last are eligible for federal tax credits or are presented by a salesperson to be eligible for such tax credits. The bill simply allows Georgia consumers more time to check the information presented to them during a very complex, and significant transaction before being held legally responsible. While most of us has never been asked to buy anything that expensive via door-to-door -door sales, this is a tactic that's been used specifically by the rooftop solar industry. Randy Travis, one of the investigative reporters with Fox 5, did a series of undercover reports last year that many of us saw, and I will send uh, through your office, Mr. Chairman, so uh, each and every one of the committee members can watch, uh, where uh, these tactics were used, uh, and it actually caused great harm to the individuals, and they really took advantage of some of our most vulnerable Georgia citizens. Uh, some of them were held responsible from a door-to-door -door salesman of up to $100,000. So some of the questions you might be thinking about while I'm introducing this bill is, uh, are we going to regulate the rooftop solar industry? No, we are not. All we're going to do is allow the Georgians the opportunity to verify that everything that's been said to them, whether it be the materials, the return, et cetera, by the salesperson, uh, an unsolicited door-to-door -door salesman uh, match up with what they want. Another question you might be thinking is, does SB 149's provisions apply to door-to-door -door sale when you initiated? You called up and you said, hey, would you come give me a quote for something on my home? It absolutely does not. Uh, the next question you might think about asking is, why should unsolicited door-to-door -door sales be different than any other type of sales? That's a fair question. These are elements of very high-pressure sales tactics who are literally going door-to-door -door trying to push something on someone. And again, they often go after our most vulnerable. They go after someone who may not uh, be as educated as someone else, and they often go out and specifically target the elderly. Uh, why would 30 days be a good cooling-off period to help folks out in these situations? Well, it's very simple. It's just going to allow people to check the facts. Maybe they're going to talk to a family member who might have some information, a friend, a church member, someone who they've got uh, that, that trusted advisor in their life in order to make sure what they're being sold actually matches up. Uh, and the last thing, question you might be thinking is how would a consumer knew they had the right to cancel the sales contract once they had actually signed and said, I want to buy this? Well, just like the, the rules that have been around for a long time with the Federal Trade Commission, the salesperson has to inform that person who's going to buy in writing that this is the process for canceling a sale. Uh, this is really important, and you're going to watch some of those videos, I hope, and you're going to see where someone spent tens of thousands of dollars in an area that solar wouldn't even work, and they put it on top of a trailer. 
right? So some of this is truly predatory. Again, I'm a big fan of all things technology. I think solar panels are a great way, whether it be an individual or business, to continue to perpetuate that. We're just simply having a consumer protection bill here. If there are any questions, I'd be glad to yield. Uh, just a quick one. We have in our folders your original Senate Bill 149, that's LC 365431, as well as the substitute that you presented to me yesterday, LC 365488S. You're working off of the substitute. What is the difference between it and your original bill as introduced? Yeah, while meeting with a lot of the uh, the stakeholders, uh, we decided uh, to make sure that folks who put things like windows for their homes, et cetera, that the threshold was a little too low. So we rose that uh, on line 25 payment up to $10,000 or more. Okay. And my second question is, I, I understand your intent is aimed at uh, some specific abuses in the sale of solar panels, et cetera, to homes, but... This is broader than that, right? I mean, is it anybody that's got uh, payments of 10000 more, 120-month uh, financing arrangement and eligible for federal tax credits? When, when you add the eligible tax, products yeah. that are eligible for federal tax credits. You know, once you add the, the, the federal tax credits, it, it does uh, limit that universe pretty substantially, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Uh, and again, we don't want to prohibit this at all, right? We want people to be innovative. We want them to look at alternate sources of energy. We just don't want people to get taken advantage of. Right. Other questions for Senator Albers? Uh, Senator Ginn. Stayed up all night. Thank you. Questions. You're doing a good job. I like your homework. Yeah. Uh, a couple of hard. questions. One of them is mm -hmm. you said that this would not apply if you called up and asked for a quote from a company. The uh, So I'm thinking a door-to-door -door salesman comes by and you're selling the solar panels or whatever. Said they, uh, and so it's going to apply to this vendor. But yet you said, hey, I'm going to call up this competition and get them to come out and, and give me a quote on it. Well, I'm protected under one circumstance from the, the guy that knocked on my door, had, was an aggressive the, uh, in sales. But the other one, uh, you know, I, I just, my neighbor had this other guy come by on his door and I called him. Why would we just differentiate between one sale and another sale? Why not just, you know, we're trying to protect the consumer. Why wouldn't we allow it for both? I think you bring up a very valid point, Senator. Uh, I think the original intent was to make sure that if I was proactively going to look and doing this, I'm probably um, a little more educated on the process. I'm thinking to myself, gosh, you know what? If, if I put these on my house, I might be able to save money. I, maybe I'm a real green energy person. So I've got maybe a little more far, forethought and an idea of what I want to do if I'm proactively calling and ask for that versus the person who knocked on the door and and my you know 91 year old grandmother answered the door and, and and got sold something that may have not been true so i think that was the difference uh in the logic behind that but i'd be happy to work with you on it i mean i just think it might be good to include both of them and when we start looking at all of the things that that uh we're we're, we're obviously not taking the girl scouts they uh and knocking them out of a sale with the ten thousand dollars the cookie, like you're the a really big girl the cookies scout, are safe and they uh but I, I, uh, I, I did see the the piece about a lot of people that get taken advantage of on this. I think it's a good good concept to give people that. But I, I would also like to see it that you know we include it for, uh, you know the, the you, you're you're going into a field that you don't know anything about. And you're calling people. I'd like to protect those citizens as well. Thank you, right. Senator Brass. You're recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chairman, do we do this in any other industries as far as door to door in these kind of limits? And uh, thank you, the distinguished rules chairman. I didn't want to miss your title. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, the door to door sales act is something, as mentioned, started back in 1972 that is by the FTC. Uh, there was some provisions, uh, prior. Um, this is making sure that we're staying up to snuff and codifying that. You know that there are other provisions in the code. Um, as an example, you've got like when you buy a car, right? You have a few days to to go back on that purchase if there's some type of a problem. Um, so we try to put these consumer practices in place while maintaining that we are also a capitalist society and, and we want you know there to be a good relationship between business and consumers. So I think this is just putting us in the guardrails. 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, I was just looking for something to compare this to. I think, actually, the car analogy is a decent one, although they don't go door-to-door, but they might try. I don't know. Well, now the DLG won't be your Valentine. I will be. So. <laughs> Any other committee members Passed. have questions for the author? All right. I uh, recognize Mr. Kevin Curtin to provide his viewpoints on this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Kevin Curtin with Georgia EMC. Um, we just wanted to come up today and tell you that we are 100% uh, in favor of Senate Bill 149. Thank you, Senator Albers, for introducing this measure. And the reason we are in favor of it is that the experience of our a lot of our members around the state has been um, something that has really opened our eyes to some of the less reputable sales practices of some, and I will say some, not all, some in the uh, solar industry. Um, and you may be asking yourself, why do you care about that as a, you're a power company? And the reason we care about that is, quite frankly, many times in their sales presentation, they will represent themselves to actually represent the power company. So when these sales go bad and somebody realizes they bought something they don't need, maybe 25 days in, they call the power company and start complaining to us that you sold me something I didn't need. Well, we had nothing to do with the sale to start with. But oftentimes our name is dropped into the sales presentation as somebody who's trying to actually sell them the solar panels. So that creates a lot of ill will between our members and their members. Um, I wanted to just briefly introduce uh, Drew Hook, who is the manager of residential energy services with one of our members, Greystone Power, who represents some counties just to the west of the metro area. And Drew has a lot of experience in dealing with actual consumers who have gone through this situation and I think can show you some real life examples of what's occurred in the market that this bill would protect against. Uh, Drew. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, members of uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, as Kevin stated, I work with Greystone Power. We serve the west side of Atlanta, about eight counties. Uh, we're the fourth largest EMC in the state, uh, 16th largest in the country. And we too have seen a huge uprise in issues where members after the fact have come to us saying, hey, I'm still getting a power bill. Um, they told me I wasn't going to have this. And, and now we're left dealing with someone who has a very expensive system on their home and it's not performing like it's they were promised. So at Greystone, we pride ourselves on being the trusted energy advisor to our members. Um, we currently have just over 400 rooftop systems um, on our system. That number was about 42 in 2019. So uh, throughout the pandemic in 2021, we've seen a huge increase of door-to-door -door sales. Um, a lot of these members um, are elderly, uh, may not speak perfectly good English or understand English. Um, some of the complaints uh, that we get are their promises that they were promised but it wasn't put in writing in the contract. Uh, the most common one is uh, you're not going to have a utility bill. Um, they've had issues with damage to their home, uh, holes in the roof, sheetrock, um, lies about what the solar system is capable of actually doing. Um, a good example of that would be there's only so much sunshine in a day. And if you're factoring that the system's going to perform at this rate, but you're using 24 hours of sunlight, well, that's not possible here in Georgia or anywhere. So um, that's one of the things we're seeing. Um, we've got a short video where actually uh, one of the sales reps that Greystone actually had to send a cease and desist letter to the company out of South Carolina um, actually knocked on uh, an employee's door who works for Greystone and just so you can see. Alarm's going on. <laughs> Yeah, Greystone sent you guys a letter regarding the new solar program. Do you remember getting that? Well, I actually work for Greystone. Oh, really? Okay. So basically, they're allowing you to own, you know, go solar and own a significant amount of your power? I'm no, not sure that's not how that works. Not through Greystone. <laughs> so first off, let me just state that 
Greystone does not send our members packets of information in the mail um, in support of one solar company or another. Um, we do send out educational material, um, social media posts and things like that to, to help educate our members. But um, what this gentleman told was um, just not, not true. Um, yeah. A few other examples of this, um, we have a Hispanic woman in our territory that recently uh, contacted us back in September, October of 2022. Um, we actually went out to her home with someone, um, spoke to her, and it was apparent that after she signed a 30-plus page contract uh, that was in all English that she had no idea what she had signed. Um now she's living with a about a $75,000 system on a double wide mobile home and paying $93 a month currently. But she was also promised that when her $13,000 tax incentive comes in, that it would reduce her monthly payment. She was promised no electric bill that she would just be paying the, the $93 a month. Um, that's not happening. Um, she still has usage and she still has the uh, fee associated with that. Um, and last, just to finish up, one of the things that Greystone is doing along with other EMCs in the state is we've put a lot of time and effort into a uh, rooftop solar assessment tool where we promote and, and, and send it out to our members like, hey, go through this short survey. It's very easy to do. You can find it on our website. To, to better understand what they're actually purchasing and what potential paybacks could come. Um, we don't talk about tax incentives. Uh, that's for, for them and their tax advisor. Um, but we, we use numbers that were provided nationally through SIA and other groups uh, that show what realistic expectations should be. And, and what we find is what the number we show versus what somebody pays in a high pressure sale environment is, is two different things. That's all I have. That's great. Thanks for that first hand testimony. Uh, Chairman Brass, you recognize. Jumping in for Chairman Ginn. Um, so if we're giving them only 30 days, is that going to be enough for them to have an assessment of, I mean, that might be one power bill cycle, correct? Yes, sir. I think the, the hope would be that within the 30 business days that they would have the opportunity to to really let sink in what they they signed up for and you know maybe talk to a family member or somebody else hopefully a family member is not the one that talked them into it or, or got somebody to come knock on their door in the first place but um i, I think i think that's a good amount of time you do okay thank you senator i think uh what we're talking about is they sign the contract they're not going to install it yeah right away right it's going to be 30 days so it gives them a time to make sure that did i make a mistake before this even happens they start you know drilling holes in the roof and doing everything else um, and, and again that's a protection also for the good companies that are out there right if they wait 30 days and everything's legit then they're going to go ahead and spend the money to install and do that anyhow well i guess my concern and a question i mean in the example that you used with that Hispanic lady, she she wouldn't know if she was getting a raw deal until after after the fact. So I don't see how the 30 days would have I don't know that it would have helped her. Well, I, it, and there's where I think the opportunity is, you know, people make emotional um, decisions sometimes. Right. Whether it be high pressure sales or something else is happening in your life. When you've got a, a, some time to think about that or you're having Sunday dinner with your family or your neighbor comes over and they say, hey, what's going on? I saw the guy there in the truck. You start having a conversation. They say, let me see that contract with you. It gives them that opportunity to hopefully safeguard themselves. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Thanks for being with us, gentlemen. We appreciate your input. Okay. That concludes our presentations of the two bills today. We will be taking action on these soon or they'll be available for action. <clears throat> we will be meeting Thursday afternoon. I'll have an agenda out tomorrow. Several new bills got assigned to the committee that we're going to, I've got to read over and look inside, uh, you know, sort of priorities. By my calculations, we only have probably five meetings left. So things are about to get uh, fast. A um, couple of, of announcements and then we'll adjourn. Our committee 
dinner is next Wednesday night on the 22nd. Quite a few of you have signed up to sponsor. We appreciate that and welcome you committee members. Please let Cindy know if you're able to go. We're going to have a big time at 57th Fighter Group uh, Buffet Mill. This jockey present, you get to see the planes land and take off at PDK uh, there, which is right out the uh, the window uh, from this the bunker room. We'll be out there, so I encourage everybody to attend if you can. Going out there to watch the hot air balloons. We're gonna shoot them down. Get to see them be shot down. Uh, that'll be good. I have allowed up until this point uh, testimony by Zoom or or by. Uh, telephone and uh, it is getting to be a little burdensome on the um, Senate press office to do that. And it's, it flows so much less easily. I'm going to encourage uh, testimony to future meetings to be live where possible. We had folks from Tesla were out of state. We've made some, some exceptions along the way. And I just wanted to, to you know, alert the crowd to not expect that we'll be taking zoom testimony it lets us interact more people stay afterwards we can talk to them etc just wanted to give fair notice of that and uh with that we stand adjourned thank you